My name's Jeff Bajoric, and my career in sales has been a hell of a ride. And I want to bring you along with me. If you prefer to sell things at a premium, if you never want to win a deal on price, rethink the way you sell. Welcome back to the show. My name's Jeff Bajoric. I'm your host, and I'm here to help you rethink the way you sell. Today, we're going to get right into it. I'm here with my friend Jason Bay, who is my favorite person in the world, to talk about how the way we train reps, the way we onboard reps, the way we create models and context for reps is broken. It's wrong. It's misguided. It's well-intended, but it's misguided. And like I said, there's no one I'd rather talk to about this than Jason. I'm going to get right into it. We're going to jump right into the interview here, and I'll be back with you on the other side to break down a couple of things that I took away from it and hopefully give you a couple of things to think about as well. You are my number one go-to resource, expert, guru, whatever you want to say. I love the way you approach prospecting. And there are so many ways that we can go. And, you know, if, if some of the people listening right now could be flies on the wall of some of our conversations about what we see that is wrong with how prospecting is being taught these days, or just, the, you know, us pulling our hair out, relatively speaking, you know, to why people aren't doing the work that they know they need to do, right? It seems like a simple fix. Um, it's not so simple, though. Um, why would you say people whether it's an SDR or someone who carries, you know, a, a, a bag door to door, why aren't people prospecting, even though they know they should? Well, you said something about pulling out hair that I should talk about for, I don't have any hair to pull out. Yet. I pulled all of it out. <laughs> you have tweezers, gone, right? You know, you, you get, <laughs> there, there are a lot of ways to pull hair out, right? <laughs> I recognize that about halfway um, through my statement. I'm like, he's going to let me, he's never going to let me hear the end of this, but... <laughs> Um, it's a good question. I think there's, I think there are a lot of reasons why. So if, if I talk, uh, through the lens of the rep, you know, if I'm not really getting any sort of enablement on how to do this, it becomes one of those, Hey, you know how to work out Jeff, right? Why don't you just work out every oh, day? And man. if that were that simple, everyone would be in really good shape. Right. So yeah. we know that, you know, prospecting is a lot like eating your vegetables, you know, it's it's not usually a, a super fun thing to do, although the best people I know that do it do enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a couple things that for some reason we like to treat prospecting very different from selling. And they are different activities, but they're they're more the same than they are different. And we like to treat prospecting like this. Uh, hey, you can get on Google, right, and find companies. Yeah. Pick up the phone and call them. Right. And if you can find an email address on their LinkedIn profile, email them. That would be like training a new rep on how to do a discovery and demo call by saying, uh, hey, Jeff, you have Zoom, right? Hop on a Zoom call. <laughs> ask them what they need and tell them that we can help them and ask for the deal. It's like you would never do that. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yet that's how we approach outbound. And I think from a, a sales standpoint, uh, a rep, if you kind of sit and think about what the experience is like, being on the receiving end of that as a rep, it looks a lot like this, you know? Uh, the way that I learned how to do this is maybe one session in onboarding through some ad hoc training. Mm -hmm. The way that I practice, on prospects. The way that I execute, alone, in my bedroom, apartment, home office, house, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Coaching, sporadic, I don't know, maybe here, there. That's what the experience looks like for a rep. So until that changes, behavior is not going to change. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get people to do something that is really hard that where they will experience a lot of rejection if they do it incorrectly. That is just a losing battle. You're never yeah. going to be able to motivate someone to do that. So I always think about this through the, through the lens of leadership. Yeah. It's your job to enable people with the things that they need to prospect mm -hmm. and look for people that are willing to work hard, but I can't expect people to do this with no direction. That's an unfair expectation as a leader. Yeah. It's interesting too. Like I have a degree in sports medicine. I spent the time in the weight rooms. I spent the time in the training rooms. I spent the time in the exercise physiology classes. I know about periodization. I know about Olympic lifts. I know about compound movements. I know about multiplanar activities. I know about all these things because I had to use those. You had to use that expertise in, in my job. My, my job was to keep athletes on the field. And when they couldn't be on the field, I had to get them back there as quickly as possible. So I have 
more detailed knowledge about how that works than 99% of the people out there, okay? You know what I hate? Writing my own workouts. And you know what's interesting is what I love to do, though, is work out. And so, you know, I've gone off on, you know, my my cult membership with Orange Theory Fitness, but what I love most about Orange Theory is that it checks all those boxes for me. Like I know the science behind it, it makes sense, it works, but I don't have to think about what to do before I do it. I can show up, do what I'm told for an hour, and I know it's working really well, and I'm really good at it. Like once I get in the mode of doing it because someone has given me the guidance, someone has pointed me enough in the right direction, and that's what I think you're talking about here with enablement here, which is slightly different than training because training is going to build your knowledge, but knowledge isn't the issue. It certainly isn't in my analogy with you know, my, my exercise and, and my gym uh, behavior. We need to create an environment where people want to do it, not just tell them to go do it. Is that a fair way to to kind of uh, an- analogize what what you're saying here? Yeah, totally. It's um like if we want to use the exercising as an analogy, you don't just approach working out and saying, "Hey, I'm going to go to the gym," and just I have no idea what I'm going to do every time. Mm-hmm. This is why insert celebrity's name workout routine exercise routine is like one of the most popular Google searches, right? People want the routine, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you have to provide that to reps. I think where it starts is just like, you have to think about all of the things that a person is going to do in their job, a rep's going to do in their job. And all, all of those things, the, the more that complexity there is, the more it's going to eat their willpower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the more you have to think about what you're going to do in all of these different scenarios, the more it's going to eat and drain your willpower. Mm -hmm. So I want to eat that complexity as a sales organization. I want to eat the complexity for my reps. I want you to be able to use that brain power in a live conversation. I don't want you to eat up brain power figuring out what tool I should use to find someone's email address. Right. What I should say to someone that is a VP of marketing versus a VP of sales, Mm -hmm. what they care. I want to eat all of that complexity Mm -hmm. as a sales organization. That's where the training comes in. You can't have these ad hoc trainings that we do. We can't expect them to figure this out in onboarding. This needs to be something that you make a focus every single week. And it could be bite-sized enablement. Hey, you guys, everyone, what we're gonna work on today and this week, we're gonna make a really big focus of, we're gonna open cold calls in a way that doesn't get you rejected right away, okay? Yeah. We're gonna introduce ourselves, Jeff, Jason with Blissful Prospecting. We're gonna use a permission-based opener. Look, I know I probably caught in the middle of something. You got a minute for me to tell you why I'm calling. You can let me know if you want to keep chatting. We're just going to enable the shit out of that technique. And we're just going to focus on that for a week, two weeks. That's all we need to do. Yeah. I need to provide that as a sales leader to my organization, though. I can't count on these individuals to go educate themselves. And it's a completely different thing if I'm giving advice to a rep. Like, you need to be your own enablement if you're not getting it. Yeah. But it's just completely unacceptable, man to not provide this to your, to your team. Look, you know how to prospect. I know you know how to prospect, but something still gets in your way. As a matter of fact, I've identified eight reasons that you and your team are not creating more sales opportunities. I put them together as a white paper to serve as a companion of this season of the Rethink the Way You Sell podcast. Go to jeffbajorek.com forward slash eight reasons to download your copy and the self-assessment that is included in that white paper so you know where you can make maximal impact right away to improve your prospecting results. Now back to the show. So I want to ask in a minute what the new model should look like, and and I know you've got some suggestions for what that framework looks like, but before I get into that, it's it's interesting because you talk about leaders, and I've been thinking about this, and I've actually had some conversations with some others here really recently. I'm like, do you have any idea how much revenue you're leaving on the table as a leader when you say, oh, we compensate them in their own best interest. If they just go and do the work, they're going to be okay. 
Like the apathy that is involved in that yeah. is hurting your business. It's not just not helping, it's hurting your business. You're hurting your culture. You're obviously hurting your revenue. You're hurting your own uh, personal revenue because your commission is based on, you know, typically the, the performance of the team. Otherwise, your comp plan is pretty bad, you know, but like all of the ways that. You're just excusing yourself from your role because you're like, oh, well, we hired good people. We pay them well. They should go and just do whatever they need to do. Like that is such garbage from a leadership standpoint, but that's probably a discussion for another time. We'll talk about that then. What does the new framework look like? If we're going from, hey, here's the training. You've been onboarded. It's really product training. I wrote about this the other day. This is really product training. Yep. And we're talking about products, making reps memorize all the minutia about their products instead of showing them how to solve problems and then just having a little bit of a an idea of which product might help solve the problem. But ad hoc training, no practice. Just get out there and do it. You'll get the reps by talking to you know people who would otherwise give us money and then we're doing it by ourselves. Maybe you're in a bullpen, but you're you're on your own. And then there's very little coaching. So what do we change that to? What is that? What what do those four steps translate to in, in a better model? Yeah. So what we need to do that the sort of new way of doing this is we got to really kind of do the opposite in each of those areas. So if we look at that first way, how training and, and learning typically takes place, I gave you an example with the uh, cold calling. Well, we need to do micro training. We can't just uh, in an onboarding say, here's how we do it. Uh, one time you're going to sit down for three hours. Like we all know that people don't learn very effectively like that. Right. I mean, Gardner came out with a really interesting, some insights in that, you know, 90% of sale our reps, uh, sales reps forget 90% of what they learn in 30 days. And I, if I had to make a bet, I would say it's even higher than that. And faster you know than I mean? that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and way faster. Yeah. So um, I know because I'll do a cold call training, and I think I'm, I like to think I'm pretty good at what I do. And then I'll mm -hmm. listen to recordings later that day that they'll send over to me, and they completely revert back to what they were doing before. Yeah. It just happens, yeah. right? It's it's uh, it's human nature. So micro training is saying, hey, instead of saying here's how we do outbound, it's like, hey, let's just talk about how we get people on the phone, mm -hmm. and let's break the phone call down into the first sixty seconds where people typically get shut down. Let's break down the middle section in terms of questions that we can ask and problems that we might ask about. And then how do we say goodbye? You know, how do we ask for a meeting? Yeah. The same way that if you're training someone on how to do discovery, you would say, hey, how do we introduce this call and get it off to the right foot? How do we ask really good problem-based questions? How do we find the gap? And how do we secure next steps? You don't teach that all at once. You teach it in buckets, mm -hmm. right? No different than a basketball player um, isolating the dribbling practice. Right and then the defense, and then the shooting, et cetera. So I need to go from these ad hoc trainings and these crazy onboardings to micro training. And you need to spend more time on this, educating people on their personas. The number one thing that people neglect, even the people that say that they don't just spend all their onboarding on product training, is I literally need to get this. We reach out to VP of sales, I need to know their priorities. What are the yeah. things that they care about that sort of intersect with what we care about? What solution do they have in place, even if that's doing it themselves or using spreadsheets or whatever? Right. And what problems does that create? And what do they actually want? What are their goals? Like, I need those things. Every persona, I need to be able to educate my reps on that. Mm -hmm. So that's bucket number one, how we learn. The way that we practice, and uh, Jordana, who we're both a big fan of, she, oh, yeah. she was just on your podcast and talked about this. Um, the way that we practice needs to be through structured simulations and role plays. We can't practice on prospects. It should not be acceptable for your reps to learn something and then use it for the first time on a prospect. Right. That's not what world-class sales organizations do. That is mm. unacceptable. <laughs> okay, we have to raise our standards here. So really easy thing for you to do is pair up your reps, pair up people that are really good at certain things that also struggle with that same thing. Pair those people up and have them spend the first five to 15 minutes a day practicing. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, Jason with Blissful Prospecting, blah, 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 blah. Practice that permission-based opener. Practice, 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 yeah. practice, practice, right? Um, give them an actual structured simulation. Hey, Jeff, I'm going to give you uh, five bullet points on who the prospect is and what their problems are, but don't tell David, okay? He's going to call you. He's not going to know this stuff about you, but I want you to actually be able to do a real role play with him and pretend like you're a real prospect and the situation is 
set up in advance. Mm-hmm. So we need to actually facilitate practice. We can't just say, go, go get after it. I'm going to set that up as a sales leader. Mm-hmm. In terms of how we execute, number three, a lot of teams that I work, I think every single team is at least hybrid. There's reps spread out across the entire country. Even if they got an oh, yeah. office, there's people that work in all across the country. So one of the really simple things that you can do, I call them get shit done sessions, mm-hmm. is if you want your team to prospect, have them do it together. Two one hour blocks a week, have everyone hop on a Zoom or Teams call and say, you know what, guys, we're going to send out personalized emails right now. And I run this, Jeff, like a group workout class. Sure. So I'll say, hey, five minutes. All right. Prep your list, Jeff. Everyone. Cool. All right. 15 minutes. Go. Timer's on. Music's on. All right. Your goal is to send out three personalized emails. Drop into the chat when you get an email ready. I'll take a look. Give you some live feedback. Uh, Drop a prospect in. You're having trouble researching. Drop it in. Then a five minute break. And then a 15 minute sprint, five minute break. And when I do this, people send out 10 or 15 emails. They're they're more productive than they are on their own because we're doing it together. We're having fun. You could do the same thing with cold calls. Everyone puts themselves on mute. We're making calls together. In the chat, you drop it in. You just create as best as you can that bullpen or that, you know, sales floor type of environment. And then lastly, and I'll shut up, is the the feedback part, the coaching part. Um, this this I I listen to a call every now and then, or I do coaching in my one-on-ones is not good enough. Right. That's not enough coaching. Again, in sports, you would never play a game and then wait an entire week to talk about the game tape and what went well and what didn't. That's just, (laughs) you just would never do that in any other type of environment. So with coaching, I think the challenge is, you know, how do we kind of scale our coaching? So how do we make sure that if I help you, Jeff, with something that others benefit from that? Mm -hmm. How can I adopt more of a group coaching type of model? The way you do that is really simple. If I'm really focused on cold calling, when people record their calls, I'm going to open up a Loom video. I'm going to record myself, Jeff, giving you feedback on the call. You know what I'm going to do with that? I'm going to share it with the rest of the team. Yeah. So they can get that coaching insight. One of my clients, Ryan Fox, over at a company called Carta, this guy's a stud. Mm -hmm. Um, Shout out to Ryan. He, what he did for me is instead of just sending one of his recordings for a cold call from his rep to me, he recorded himself giving feedback to the rep. Awesome. And he sent it to me and it was really meta. I was giving him feedback on his feedback. Yeah. (laughs) What he also does with his reps, and I told him, I was like, I'm stealing this idea from you. It's so brilliant. Is he's like, have your reps coach themselves before they get coaching from you. Uh, Ah, let's create a coaching environment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you could do this with sales calls too. Have your rep watch their own call through and give themselves feedback and then send it over to you. I'm, I'm able to kind of calibrate with the rep that way. Are they picking up what I'm putting down? Are they learning how to fish? But you can do micro coaching like that. Like your reps should get multiple times throughout the week, two, three times a week. At least they should be getting some sort of micro coaching from you. If nothing else. So they know that you're listening and paying attention. Right. And what if... I mean, think about the tone that that sets. And you're lit one, if there's a call that comes out every day, what does it take you to judge or to, to score a cold call or to coach on a cold call, right? There's only some, those aren't very long, right? It's not like we're going through and breaking down discovery, you know, once a day and that's an hour and then it's, you know what I mean? Or 30 minutes or whatever it is like for stuff like this. And there's certainly a reason to, to, coach through discovery and things too, don't get me wrong. But, you know, from, you know, if it's reviewing an email, to, you know, listening to a cold call or a couple, takes they five know- Takes five to 10 minutes. Right. <laughs> and, and, and they know that you're doing it, right? So they're, they're on their game all the time because they know they're potentially being watched. And you get five minutes of coaching every day. I will take five minutes of coaching every day versus an hour once a week. Because more of it's going to stick. And there's something to that time under tension. You know, and I've talked about this a little bit. I haven't really fleshed the whole thing out, but we go back to the gym, right? Like the, the, the speed with which you lift, there's value to going slowly. There's value to going quickly. But time under tension is a factor. The longer you can have someone's brain in an environment where they're thinking about how they could get better. And that's why I love, um, you know, the mindset of coach yourself first. Okay, so not only are you 
you going to review your call after you make the call? You're going to be thinking about how you sound in real time. Then you're going to review it. Then your manager's going to review it. Then if they're smart, they're going to send it to you so you can review it too. And now we have all these layers and that sounds inordinately complex. It sounds like way too much effort. It's really not. It's five minutes and then you share it in Slack or on Teams or in text, yep. like whatever. It doesn't have to be, if it just becomes a part of the routine, it's like, hey, sometime this morning, review this call. Let me know what you think. This is what I think is shared in the in the video, right? Just go check it out. Have a great day. Go make some appointments today. Go, go make some sales today. We've done so many things to overcomplicate and, and not even overcomplicate, but to we've made so many things difficult that don't need to be. I'm loving the trend that I'm starting to see of, hey, can we just make this simple again? Can we just like remember what we're here to do and know who you help, know how you help them and put yourself in front of them? It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. So the thing that I would say is that when you start to create these recordings, with Loom or Vidyard or whatever you're using, sure, you could put them into a bank. So you allow reps to coach themselves. So think about all the situations you as a sales leader get asked about. And you're like, mm -hmm. dude, I get asked the same question multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. We'll answer it one time in a real example and then create a little bank, a little FAQ page or a, dr a drive folder in Google Drive or whatever. And you have this huge bank. Hey, prospect said to send more information over them uh, in the cold email. Uh, prospect uh, said pricing was too high in the disco call. You know, like you just start to build a big bank and before you know it in a, in a month or two, you have a whole playbook. Yeah. And yeah. now reps can use that playbook to coach themselves because that's really where the beauty's at of this is when people can coach themselves. That's what you want as a sales leader. I don't want to be getting calls all throughout the day in Slack messages about what to do in certain situations. I want people to know how to fish. That's awesome. That's so good. And it was funny that you mentioned that because that's actually the strategy that I've taken with this podcast is trying to categorize all of this stuff and put it in one place. You want to know about top performers? You go to season two. You want to know about prospecting and particularly why people are struggling with their prospecting? Season three. That's what it's all about. Like just creating yep. this resource. There's so much content that is being created and then not, and it's disposable. And that's just not right. Like there's some really good stuff out there that we're ignoring because it's not new. Um, Jason, mileage. this was awesome. That's the word I always come on, like mileage. I want to get mileage out of every coaching moment I want to get mileage out of. That's awesome. That's awesome. I could talk to you for like another hour about this. I know we, we got to keep it short though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just means that we'll have to have you on more and more often. That's all good. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> yep, you bet, man. So what did you think? I had a lot of fun talking to Jason. I had a lot of fun listening to that interview again. And, you know, I scribbled some notes while I was uh, listening back to this. So hopefully I could recap some things for you. So hopefully if you're driving or you're running or walking the dog or something like that, you don't have something to write on. Um, let me make some of those points indelible for you. Okay. You have to create the environment where reps want to prospect, not that they just feel like they have to. Right. Look, salespeople don't like being told what to do. But if you can make a sale, if you're a leader and you treat your reps like your customers, and that's another concept that I talk a lot about, when you recognize that your reps are your best customers and you get them to want to act in their best interest, which means it's in the organization's best interest, a lot of great things happen. So are you just telling your reps to prospect or are you creating an environment where they want to? Think about that. You have to reduce or what Jason says, eat the complexity. I say reduce the friction. You leave it up to them to figure it out on their own and they're going to be stuck and they're going to be stuck longer than necessary. That is going to impede your results. There's no reason for that. The whole hands-off management uh, you know, style of, oh, go figure it out for yourself, not productive. Obviously, they need to figure some things out on their own to make it their own, to personalize some things. But give them a map. Don't just say, go get them, bucko. Like, th that's just not acceptable anymore. And then I love what Jason talks about the new way to train is it's micro training. It's micro coaching. You can do this in five minutes a day. There's no reason that you can't. You just have to think outside the box a little bit. But when you realize that they get one onboarding training and then they're kind of sent to the wolves, they're practicing on their customers. They don't get a ton of feedback. Why don't we do this better? 
And what is really good too, and I hadn't recalled this actually until I had remembered, until I'd gone back and rewatched this this interview. But Jason, I you know uh, identified a lot of ways that even remote teams can recreate that sales bullpen, which is what I talked about in the last episode. So if you didn't hear that, go back and listen to the episode about models and how most reps don't have the right models. This was a lot of fun. I hope that you learned something. I hope that you're going to do something with this. If not, give me a call. Shoot me an email, jb at jeffbajoric.com. You can follow me on LinkedIn. There is a link there, and there's one on my website too where you can book some time with me. We'll talk about this. If your team's struggling with this, it doesn't need to be that difficult. But if your team is struggling with this, I can help you. And um, I think you should also follow Jason Bay, clearly. If you didn't learn anything in the 20 minutes that he and I were together, then go back and listen again, because that was fun to listen to. And it was so packed full of advice and information. Follow Jason on LinkedIn. You can listen to the Blissful Prospecting podcast, and you can also check out what he's doing at blissfulprospecting.com. Thank you for being here. I hope you learned something. I hope you tell a friend about it. And I hope you're back with me again in a couple of days. Rethink the Way You Sell is a Pot About It production. It's mixed and edited by Doug Branson, with music by Blue Dot Sessions and Doug Branson. This podcast is masterminded by Jeff Bajoric.